Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gilligan, and I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. 100 years ago, Herbert Hoover, then stationed in Paris as director of the American Relief Administration and a delegate to the post-war Paris Peace Conference, telegraphed home to California with the $50,000 pledge to build a World War I collection at Stanford University. We celebrate this pivotal moment as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution, whose overall mission is to recall the voice of experience, to make and preserve peace, and to sustain the safeguards of the American way of life. In recognition of this momentous occasion, we have organized a centennial speaker series titled A Century of Ideas for a Free Society. The series features 11 panel discussions, which take place over the course of the year to showcase the rigorous scholarship and research central to the institution's missions and values. Before we watch a short video to acquaint you with the history and founding of the institution and the legacy provided by Herbert, Herbert Hoover, let me briefly introduce the participants of today's discussion, which is entitled A Century of Prosperity, a review of the living standard between 1919 and 2019. Our first panelist closest to me is Terry Anderson. Terry is the John and Jean Denault Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is the past president of the property uh, Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana, and a professor emeritus at Montana State University. Terry is one of the founders of free market environmentalism, the idea of using markets and property rights to solve environmental problems. His most recent book, Unlocking the Wealth of Indian Nations, was published in 2016 and explores the institutional underpinnings of American in Indian reservation economies. John Kogan, on the far end, is the Leonard and Shirley Ely Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a faculty member in the Public Policy Program at Stanford University. John's research is focused on U.S. budget and fiscal policy, federal entitlement programs, and health care. His latest book, The High Cost of Good Intentions, was published in 2017 and received the 2018 Hayek Prize. The book traces the history of U.S. federal entitlement programs from the Revolutionary War to modern times. Leo Hanian is the one sporting the interesting shoe. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor of economics and director of the Edinger Family Program in Macroeconomic Research at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's the associate director of the Center for Advanced Study and Economic Efficiency at Arizona State University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research where he co-directs the research initiative entitled Macroeconomics Across Time and Space. He is also a fellow in the Society for the Advancement of Economic Theory. His research focuses on economic crises, economic growth, and the impact of public policy on the economy. George Schultz is the Thomas W. and Susan B. Ford Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution. George has had a very long and distinguished career in government, in academia, and in the world of business. He is one of only two individuals in US history who has held four different federal cabinet posts. He has taught at three of the country's most uh, greatest universities and for eight years was president of a major engineering and construction company. When asked to provide an introduction at Hoover roundtables and conferences, he likes to keep it simple by saying, George Schultz, United States Marine. <laughs> the moderator for this panel is Peter Robinson, the Murdoch Distinguished <clears throat> Policy Fellow at the Hoover Institution, where he writes about business and politics, edits Hoover's quarterly journal, the Hoover Digest, and hosts Hoover video series programs, hosts the, video, the Hoover video series program entitled Uncommon Knowledge. Now, please enjoy this introductory vi uh, video, and the program will follow thereafter. The Hoover Institution is the nation's preeminent research center dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Hoover research has directly led to policies that have produced greater opportunity and freedom in the United States and the world. How has Hoover achieved this distinction? <laughs> 
by assembling an extraordinary fellowship of policy-oriented academics and scholarly practitioners, by offering open access to a world-renowned library and archives, and by resolutely focusing on ideas that define a free society. Herbert Hoover is the founder of the institution that bears his name. After graduating in Stanford's pioneer class in 1895, he became a successful mining engineer, renowned humanitarian, and president of the United States. While administering famine relief to Belgium during World War I and participating in the subsequent Paris Peace Conference, Hoover recognized the importance of collecting historical material that could yield knowledge about preventing a recurrence of the calamities he had witnessed in Europe. In April 1919, he pledged $50,000 to Stanford University to support his war collection. We celebrate this pivotal moment 100 years ago as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution. By 1929, Hoover's War Library contained 1.4 million items and had already become the largest in the world focused on the Great War and its aftermath. Collecting expanded to include material related to social, political, and economic change in the 20th century. Hoover Tower was completed in 1941 to house the rapidly growing library and archive. In 1957, the collection was definitively renamed the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Hoover's vision for the institution is captured in a statement to the Stanford Board of Trustees in 1959. The institution supports the Constitution of the United States, its Bill of Rights, and its method of representative government. The overall mission of this institution is, from its records, to recall the voice of experience against the making of war, and by the study of these records and their publication, to recall man's endeavors to make and preserve peace. The institution itself must constantly and dynamically point the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. <clears throat> By the 1970s, the institution was generating influential research on government regulation, tax policy, national security, health care, social security, energy, and proposals to limit government expenditures. Many innovative public policy proposals developed by Hoover Fellows were adopted in the 1980s, and Hoover contributed influential policy ideas for countering communism that ultimately led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991. The all-volunteer army, the flat tax, the Taylor rule for monetary policy, and school choice and accountability are all transformative policy ideas generated by Hoover Fellows. Hoover's timeless fundamental values of freedom, private enterprise, and limited effective representative government derived from 100 years of scholarship and the lessons of history. The Hoover Institution is poised for even greater impact in the years ahead, informing the marketplace of ideas, advising the country's policymakers, and illuminating the road to prosperity and peace in America and around the world. This lecture series brings together Hoover Fellows to discuss how the ideas and values that have undergirded the institution for 100 years remain crucial in understanding and formulating public policy in the 21st century. This past century has witnessed dramatic improvements in our standard of living. The prosperity that we enjoy today could hardly have been imagined a hundred years ago. The focus of this panel is on the sources of that remarkable advancement. We'll consider the role of governmental and non-governmental institutions and of leadership. And we'll consider the importance of economic policy. Property rights reward individuals who invest in human resources, physical capital, and resource stewardship. That explains why the United States has such a productive labor force, uses its resources wisely, and takes care of the environment. Property rights are the key to prosperity. Good economic policies have been crucial in creating the economic growth and prosperity that our country has enjoyed. America's historical record and considerable scholarly research shows that low tax rates, limited regulation, Free trade and sound monetary policy are the foundations of the free market process that's created so much economic growth in this country.
I'm 98 years old now, so I've been around and seen it all. <laughs> I have five children. I have 11 grandchildren. And I have six and a half great-grandchildren. <laughs> so I'm wondering about them. We've faced plenty of challenges in the past. We've always come through. Because we have had the right ideas, ideas sustaining a free society, and we've had leadership. If we have those ideas and the leadership we need, we'll be fine. As we reflect upon this past century, it is important to understand the policies and institutions that have allowed us to achieve this remarkable advancement in human well-being. <laughs> I'm told that that, ah, <laughs> we wait for the screen to retract. Are you afraid of a screen? I am afraid of a screen. <laughs> You're not a Marine. <laughs> Two statistics and a brief list. Statistic one, gross domestic product per person in real terms, that is adjusted for inflation. In 1919, the year the Hoover Institution was founded, $7,500. Today, one century later, $57,000, an increase in GDP per person in the United States of America of 760%. Statistic two, life expectancy. In 1919, 55 years. Today, 79 years. Congratulations, George, you've, you've beat the averages there. <laughs> the list, the telephone, electricity, the automobile, antibiotics, air travel, the personal computer, all first developed at scale large enough to make them available to ordinary citizens right here in the United States during this past century. No other country has produced a record that matches that. One century of prosperity, why did it happen here? One final note before the first question. We have here four professional economists. We've been talking among ourselves about the topic over the last several days. Three of our panelists tend to think of the question in just those terms, economics. One of our panelists keeps saying we need to think bigger, broaden the scope. And the first question will go to that panelist. Born in 1920, George Schultz has occupied 99 of the 100 years that we are marking this evening. <laughs> George, the very first question, how should we think about prosperity? Well, I think we have to remember 1919 is an interesting year. That was the end of World War I. And World War I was settled in rather vindictive terms. And what we got out of that was World War II. The United States, at the end of World War I, withdrew from the world. We wouldn't join the League of Nations. And so we wind up with the Great Depression, the currency manipulation, and the protectionism that aggravated it. There were no rules, internationally recognized rules of the game. In the sense, so we got the Second World War, 56 million people were killed. We had the Holocaust. And then we had the Great Depression, which I mentioned. So it was a pretty tough time. And it's interesting to me that as people looked back and saw this, they wanted to produce something different. So at the end of World War II, our statesmen and economists took a different attitude. We said, quite a crummy world, but we're part of it, whether we like it or not, and we engaged. 
There were 44 countries at Bretton Woods at which the basic rules of the game economically were laid out and more or less held. And then comes the Cold War and NATO. And time after time as problems arose, the United States formed a group of some kind to get out that problem and do something about it. So all through this year, there was a constructive engagement. And I think it's fair to say that when the Cold War ended, there had been created with a lot of leadership from the United States, a security and economic commons from which everybody benefited, including us. Our problem right now, Peter, is that commons is falling apart. And there are also other forces that are changing the world dramatically. But I'll stop at that point. John Kogan, the question of underlying institutions, private property, the rule of law, free markets, the importance of those institutions. So first, George, George's point is very well taken. Um, uh, you don't get prosperity in a world where you have a lot of political instability and where you have periods of armed conflict. Uh, you get them during times of peace. Uh, world organizations can play a powerful role uh, in preserving the peace. But institutions, as George said, uh, don't just do it by themselves. They require leadership. And I'm sure, George, we will hear more about leadership uh, from you. But let me take a little bit of a different tack then and talk a little bit about the, um, the way I see prosperity occurring. And it seems to me there are three fundamental keys uh, to achieving sustained prosperity. And I want to emphasize the word sustained prosperity. Um, the first is that uh, individuals have to be free to pursue the vocation that suits their talents uh, the best. Second, they have to be able to have the opportunity to reap the benefits of their efforts. And third, the economic system has to provide individuals with the right incentives to produce the goods and services that not only benefit them the most, but benefit society the most. The institutions that give us those three attributes, I think, are the following. You alluded to them, Peter, but most importantly, the rule of law, not the rule of men. Private property, as Terry mentioned in the introduction. Free and open markets, or individuals allowed to build businesses and enter freely. And then fourth, a well-defined and limited uh, role of government in society. If you get those four fundamental institutions right, you have the, what I call the necessary conditions for a sustained uh, economic prosperity. If you get them wrong, both economics and history teaches us that you will not have sustained prosperity. You might be able to get it temporarily, but eventually you will not be able uh, to sustain it. Terry, John just mentioned your remarks in the video we saw a moment ago. You said property rights are the key to prosperity. Explain that. Well, I, I often describe property rights quite simply in the following phrase. No one washes a rental car. And uh, that sort of captures uh, what property rights are about. And I was giving a presentation to some students once, and I used that phrase, and a student had the audacity to challenge me and say I was wrong. Uh, and I said, what do you mean I'm wrong? And he said, well, that's not true. And I said, who washes a rental car? And he said, Hertz. <laughs> and that, that summarizes property rights, I think, in a nutshell. Uh, property rights are, are the key to providing the incentives for people to wash their rental cars, to care for them. Uh, I, I'm reminded the, of a study done by the Federal Reserve a few years back uh, in which they examined the resale value of buses used in public transit, buses owned by the private sector and buses owned by the public sector. And what they discovered was buses owned in the private sector sold for higher 
re resale prices, uh, used bus prices, than those in the public sector. There was the incentive to take care of that asset. And it doesn't matter whether the asset, as John suggested, is our human capital, our, our right to choose what we want to do and capitalize on it, or the savings we, we put aside, which become the capital uh, for uh, our, our economy, or our, our resources, our land, our forests, our oil, and so on. Lee, immigration. What role in the last century has immigration played in prosperity? Um, to follow up on to follow up on John's point, um, creating sustained prosperity, so economic growth that lasts over decades, over centuries, such as we have in the U.S., is challenging for society to achieve this. <clears throat> if it wasn't, there would be more examples in the United States that could have done this. So it's uh, it's 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 a tall order. Um, immigration has been a big part of that. We have been fortunate enough to attract some of the most creative and innovative talent uh, from all around the world. <clears throat> talent that's also been on <clears throat> entrepreneurial. To sustain economic growth, we need to have a constant inflow of new ideas and people who are willing to take the risk to try to implement those ideas in a competitive marketplace. And you know, we can point to people such as Andy Grove, who helped start Intel here in the Valley who developed uh, microchip technology. Uh, Sergey Brin, Stanford's own Sergey Brin, who co-founded uh, Go uh, Google and who came from the Soviet Union. And if any of you came here in a Tesla, we have Elon Musk who immigrated here from South Africa. And what's interesting is that not only has this been very, very good for us, I think there's a reason why these enormously talented people came to the United States because this is the place to be where you can make ideas become not just reality, but a remarkably big and important reality. Right. Terry, you've, you've spent a lot of time in your career uh, analyzing, studying American Indian reservations. So contrast the underlying institutions of the nation as a whole with institutions such as they are on Indian reservations and the different results. Well, let me start with uh, how I, I really got into that study. Uh, I was uh, visiting a, a tribal member from the Flathead Reservation in Montana, and I was taking some Swiss people there to visit. And I w on the way, I was trying to explain to them that our, our reservations typically are, are uh, very poor, healthcare standards are low. Uh, and, and the list goes on, and we drive up to this house, and it's a beautiful home. Uh, the cows are out in the pasture up to grass up to their bellies, and we walk in, a beautiful library. I mean, everything was just the antithesis of what I'd said. And so I, I, after we had uh, gotten acquainted a bit, I said to this gentleman, uh, how do you explain this? And he said, I own this place. And I said, but we're on an Indian reservation. And he said a second time, I own this place. And uh, I'm kind of dense, and I, I said, but, but doesn't it belong to the tribe? And he finally put his elbow on the table and leaned on his, on his uh, fist and said, I own this place. And I said, you mean like I own my house? And he said, yes. And I said, click. <laughs> uh, wow, reservations have some private land, but they have some land that isn't private. Indeed, it's for all intents and purposes owned by the federal government. And it occurred to me that it would be a, a a way to get tenure if I could get it published, uh, uh, to do a study comparing the productivity of the private lands versus what are called trust lands, those lands held in trust by the federal government because a law in 1906 said Indians can't have their own land until they're deemed competent and capable by the Department of Interior. Think of those words. So I have ex examined this question, and, and what you see on reservations is this stark contrast that illustrates what we're talking about. The private property is very productive. That which is held in trust isn't. It can't be, to, to part of what Lee's talking about, it can't be used as collateral. If you don't own it, you can't take it to the bank and say, will you let me have some money to, to buy a tractor? And so that is just a stark example of, of, of uh, how property rights matter. And then to, to put it into the modern context, uh, Ronald Reagan, Secretary of, of Interior, George, I'm sure knew, James Watt said, if you want to see an example of socialism, don't go to Russia, 
go to an Indian reservation. Russell Means, the Native American who started the American Indian Movement, in 1989 spoke to the Senate and paraphrased what Watt said and emphasized it's socialism. And it is really what, what provides a, unfortunately for the people who live on reservations, this stark contrast between the society that we all live in and socialism on a reservation. Mm -hmm. But Peter, yes, I intercept. Julie. I'd like to say a word on behalf of government, because we've been laying into it here. <laughs> you need to have a good monetary system, and only government can run it. So you want government to do a good job and have a long-run point of view toward what they're doing with the monetary system. We've had good and bad, but we need a good government there. We need to realize that we have to look out for people when they're not making it well. So we designed an unemployment compensation system that gives people some funds when they're unemployed. Doesn't give it to them, it, they've earned it by the, what they happened. We have a social security system that helps you when you're a little older. Not bad, but <laughs> these are things, and the government has to take a long-term point of view. I spent a lot of time with President Reagan. You know, he was an honorary fellow at Hoover. Yes. And one time when he was here, I had a dinner party for him over at my house on campus. And I had some heavy hitters there and all digging at Robert Reagan. And afterwards he said to me, you were a provocateur at that meeting, but what were you thinking? I said, I'm thinking that this guy has very strong views, but he understands why he has the view. Therefore, he can think strategically and give an example. When we took office, inflation was in the teens. The economy was going nowhere. And the Cold War was as cold as it could get. Paul Volcker, who had been my undersecretary when I was secretary of the Treasury, was chairman of the Fed. And he was doing what the Fed should do. He was restricting the monetary supply to get rid of inflation. And people kept running into the office, Mr. President, Mr. President, he's going to cause a recession. We're going to have loose seats in the midterm election. And Reagan smiled, and he put a political umbrella over Paul Volcker because he was able to think long and realize that you, you've got to do this to get inflation under control. And by the end of 1982, it was under, we did have a recession. We did lose seats, but inflation came under control, and the economy took off like a bird. So the long-term thinking paid off. But you need leadership, John, not just institutions. You have to have leadership, and you have to look to government to do a lot of it. So don't, don't dismiss government. Government, it's important to get it right, but it's important. This, did you hear that, uh, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> He's looking at me the whole time. <laughs> John Kogan, we've discussed underlying institutions, we've discussed We'll, I'm sure we'll discuss this more, but we've discussed the leadership necessary to make those institutions function. Draw the distinction between underlying institutions and what we're going to discuss next, which is policy. Yeah, so, so very briefly, the way I've thought about this is you can think of uh, institutions as more or less permanent arrangements or structures uh, within a society, uh, more or less permanent. Um, and it's very important that, that they remain so. When you think of economic policy, uh, think a little bit differently. Think about um, actions that government can take uh, to reallocate resources within that institutional setting that a country operates. And so it can alter taxes, spending, national security, monetary policy, international trade, uh, and so forth. Um, so that's sort of the way I've come to distinguish it. You get the institutions right, but as George says, if you don't get the economic policies right, you're probably not going to succeed in creating prosperity. So I've thought about it maybe as the institutions are the necessary conditions, and getting the institutions right and then the policies right gives you the necessary and sufficient conditions for growth. Nice formulation. Lee. Listen to a tale of two decades. The 1920s, the economy grew 
And aside from a brief recession at the very beginning of the decade, 20 to 21, unemployment remained at 4%. The 1930s, which begin in a certain sense in 1929 with a stock market crash, the economy shrinks by a third and unemployment for much of the decade runs at 25%. Now, dissertations have been written and will be written about the contrast in policy that are linked to those two very different economic experiences, but take us through it. Um, yeah, great question. The, the 1920s and 1930s um, provide, I think, a, a, a great illustration of how, as economists and really as, as everyone, we can learn how well-designed economic policies, uh, economic policies uh, that promote protection of private property, that enhance the ability of people to make mutually advantageous trades, that those kind of policies can really promote and enhance economic growth. And those policies were in place in the 1920s when we were growing at about 4% per year. We can also learn how well-intentioned economic policies, but badly designed economic policies, policies that depress incentives to work or to save or to invest or to innovate can push an otherwise healthy economy off the rails and, and keep it off the rails for a long, for a long time. So in the 1920s, um, policies promoted the facilitation of technology transfers. We saw wide-scale electrification of industry. We saw people moving off the farm into cities as technological change and agriculture made it possible to feed our country with relatively few farmers. Uh, profits boomed, businesses were highly, highly profitable, productivity uh, growth was very, very rapid. We get to 1929, um, the stock market falls. And in response to the stock market fall, what could, according to my research, what could have been a relatively short recession uh, turned into a recession that really didn't end until World War II. Uh, Peter, you mentioned unemployment being at 25 percent. Um, uh, the flip side of that, the number of people working, adults working, was about 25 percent below what it had been in, 19, in the 1920s, and that continued really up until the eve of World War II. Um, now, as economists, we study markets that function in a democratic society with good institutions in the United States, and everything we know says that we should not have a decade or more of such miserable economic performance in a well-functioning country like the United States. Um, so this is where we can learn how badly designed economic policies went awry. When the stock market fell and we entered a recession, for year after year after year, the government thought, you know, with prices falling, profits are falling, and if we just had to figure out some way, some way somehow, to increase prices, then profits would be up and businesses could pay their workers more and we would get out of this, we would get out of this depression. So what did the government do? The government, uh, and this is really unheard of today, the Sherman and Clayton Antitrust Acts were essentially completely abrogated. All non-agricultural industry was not just encouraged, but really strong-armed and required to form industrial cartels, monopolies. Economic growth does not come from monopolies. And the laws that govern this, in fact, were um, so extreme that there was, uh, there was a tailor. There's a tailor named Jack McGid. And Jack was prosecuted for pressing a suit for 35 cents when the tailor's code of fair competition prevented anyone from pressing a suit for under 40 cents. These are the type of laws that were passed in the 1930s. Economic growth is about competition. It's about allocating resources to the most efficient producers. It's not about shutting competition down. 
We've learned a lot from that episode. Uh, we've learned that competition is incredibly healthy. Uh, we've learned that competition, free competition, open markets, allowing the best to have access to resources is what creates growth. Um, we paid a 10 or 12 year period, which was a very costly to learn that. All right. John Kogan, go let, ahead. Let me make a comment. All right. In addition to what you said, all of which I agree with, by the time of the 1930s ended, the marginal rate of taxation was 90%. So no wonder it didn't go anywhere. After World War II, a young man named John F. Kennedy came along, and he proposed to reduce it from 90 to 70. And LBJ followed him, and he got it done, and the economy responded. And Ronald Reagan came along, and he got it down from 70 to 50, and the economy responded. So high marginal rates of taxation will kill an economy. Can I just follow up? Can I follow up with just one? You may. Uh, so, uh, Secretary Schultz, when you mentioned uh, Eisenhower, tax rates were so high in the 50s, when Eisenhower left office and was going to write his autobiography, his advance on the book was large enough that would have put him way into high tax rates. Congress responded with a writer on a bill that allowed Eisenhower to be taxed at a much, at a much lower at a much lower rate. Eisenhower had magic. I like Ike. <laughs> Wait, but while we're talking about tax cuts, and you, your, your job was to cover the 20s, one sentence on Andrew Mellon, Secretary of the Treasury Andrew Mellon, and those tax cuts. We entered the 1920s after the war, uh, and I think really a fundamental component was a sharp reduction in the tax rates that prevailed during World War I. Um, you know, particularly on capital income. Um, almost all economic research that's been done in the last 50 years, including important research done here by uh, Hoover economists, shows that the easiest way to kill economic growth is by placing heavy tax rates on capital income. And, and Mellon, Mellon knew that almost a century ago. Got it. So Two. let me make one, one point, Peter, on this. Uh, All right, but this is the last. If you have a point to make, forget it. <laughs> Go ahead. But you're up next. You're, you're on top one of it. One thing about these high marginal tax rates in the 50s is very few people paid them. And there's a political economy reason for that. When you raise tax rates very highly, you create incentives for lobbyists, greater incentives for lobbyists, to create loopholes to avoid those taxes. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan once described the tax system as like a uh, hydraulic system. When the rates go up, the loopholes go up, and the ability to avoid goes up. And so what we found over time is that when you lower taxes and broaden the base, you get a much more efficient system. When you try to raise taxes to raise revenues, you automatically create more rent seeking, more loopholes, and a less fair uh, tax system. And maybe uh, Eisenhower is just one example of someone <laughs> All right. yeah. benefited yeah, here, from Nothing uh, against Ike. Example, John, in 1986, Ronald Reagan's proposed 1986 Tax Act passed the Senate 97 to 3. It eliminated all these tax breaks and lowered the rates. Right. And it worked. It worked. John, two more decades. You, you're in, you, you're hop skip, skipping around here. Um, uh, so we've got, we've got a century to cover. Here we go with the 70s and the 80s. We've touched a little bit on the 80s already. Stagflation in the 70s. I'm going to come to you on this as well. Uh, unemployment rose from about 4% at the beginning of the decade to about 10% toward the end of the 70s. Inflation, which had remained below 2%, imagine that, to below 2% throughout almost all of the 1960s, rose to more than 13% by 1979. And in 1970, the economy grew by 1%. In 74 and 75, it shrank. That's the 70s. Here are the, here's the 80s. Growth. Unemployment falls to just over 5%. Inflation falls to about 3%, and the economy expands so dramatically that our late colleague here at the Hoover Institution, Marty Anderson, wrote, I'm quoting him, the period from 1982 to 1989 was the greatest expansion the world had ever seen in any country at any time, close quote. John Cogan contrasts the policies of the 70s with the policies of the 80s. Well, I do so with a little bit of trepidation because George here was serving 
uh, in the White House uh, during the 70s and during the 80s. But I'll start and then you can, uh, you can correct me, George. So here, here's the way I, I think the 70s and the 80s you know, give us a nice contrast between uh, one type of economic policy which is not conducive to growth uh, and, and another that is. Um, the policies of the 70s and the 80s <clears throat> differ really in two ways. Uh, one way was the policies of the 70s were really based on what I think of as very, very short-term thinking. The policies of the 80s were based upon a much longer view, uh, longer-term policy view. Um, and I think that's very important when you think about uh, how an economy grows. If investors and entrepreneurs can't plan, you won't get growth. So having a long-term vision for a policy is very important uh, for growth. A short-term vision really creates problems. So let me give you a, a few examples. Uh, one I'll steal from uh, John Taylor's uh, excellent writing on monetary policy. John has characterized monetary policy in the 1970s as very stop-go. Uh, Inflation would start rising and the Fed would put on the brakes. As it put on the brakes, unemployment would start rising and they'd step on the gas. And so it was stop, go, stop, go. In the 80s, as George said, uh, Paul Volcker came in, in the late 70s uh, under Ronald Reagan's umbrella, decided that his policy approach was going to be a long-term approach with a very singular goal, getting price stability. A lot of pressure on him and a lot of pressure on Ronald Reagan, as George has said, to change that policy. He didn't. He stuck with it. By the end of the decade, inflation was down around 5%, less than half of what it was when the effort started. The other area where you had stop-go policy was on the fiscal side. So in the 1970s, we'd go into a little bit of a downturn, and immediately the government would respond with investment tax credits, with temporary tax rebates, with Keynesian stimulus policies that were relatively of short-term short -term nature. Grants to states and local governments for one year, expanded unemployment benefits out to 65 weeks and so forth. So these were very, very short-term uh, short solutions. They didn't work. They got you a little bit of a sugar high, but then the economy uh, uh, just subsided. In the 80s, very different approach. We started the 80s with a recession as, uh, as a consequence, in part, of the uh, monetary uh, restraint to bring down inflation. Very deep recession, very long recession. There was a lot of pressure on President Reagan to not stay the course, to give up on his tax cuts, reverse them to increase spending with short-term stimulus plans. He rejected the stimulus plans. He rejected the, um, uh, the reversal of his uh, tax rate reductions. Uh, we saw the economy recover. And Peter, your statistics, as they show, it was just uh, one of the best uh, decades of the 20th century. So that contrast between the, the two policies at a very high level uh, one being short-term, the other being uh, long-term, I think is very important when thinking about the right economic policies. And I'll say this too, in several areas, mostly in taxes and regulation, the policy direction was very different in the 70s than it was in the 80s. Okay. Taxes sure. uh, were, uh, tax rates were raised significantly in the 70s, not so much by um, statutory changes or legislative changes. Most of the increase in tax rates came from inflation pushing individuals into higher and higher tax brackets. In the 1970s, we had 14 different brackets in the code. And so as inflation drove incomes up, people were thrown into higher and higher tax brackets. In the last four years of the 1970s, the average tax rate, average income tax rate in the United States went up by just under 20%. So the equivalent to a 20% across the board increase in tax rates. That was very damaging to the economy. With Reagan, as George has said, rates came down to 70% and then down to 28% in the latter half of the, of the 80s. Regulatory policy, same thing. Very different directions in the 70s and the 80s. 70s, big increase in the regulatory state. There's been no decade quite like the 1970s 
for increases in the, in the uh, number of regulatory agencies or the regulatory burden. The 1980s, of course, that was reversed, first in the energy sector and then throughout the rest of the economy. And we saw the results in terms of employment growth and income growth. So George? George, two men, I'd like to ask you about the contrast between Richard Nixon, who in many ways typifies the policy of the 70, 70s, and Ronald Reagan. You knew them both, you served them both. Let me begin with, here's Richard Nixon captured on tape in 1971. I'm quoting him. The difficulty with wage price controls is that the damned things don't work. They didn't work at, at the end of World War II and they will never work in peacetime, close quote. The following summer, he imposed wage and price controls. When you were director of OMB, you were right there. What's he thinking? What's, he's re what's he responding to? Well, it was a very interesting period. In the Johnson administration, there was the Vietnam War and his great society, guns and butter, they called it. And there was great concern about inflation. So his council of economic advisors propounded the concept of guidelines. And I'm a professor at the University of Chicago and I'm watching this. I'm saying to myself, this is the intellectual precursor of wage and price controls. Uh, and I worried about it. <coughs> we had a big conference on it. Milton Friedman gave a great speech. Bob Solo came, gave a speech, the case against the case against the guidelines. We had fun, but it was important. So then I become in office and I have this on my mind and I can just feel wage and price controls coming. And I worried about it. I made a speech called steady as you go. And the argument was we have the budget under control. If we have monetary policy consistent with keeping inflation under control and have the patience, steady as you go, we'll get there. It was blown away. And I found a reason why in the archives. The Hoover archives are stunning what you find in them. I found a letter from Arthur Burns, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve and Helmut Schmidt of Germany said, Arthur Burns, it's the Pope of economics, is infallible. But I found this letter, and it argued to the, it was a private letter. I didn't know it existed, but I found it in the archives. A letter from Arthur Burns to President Nixon saying, the economy has changed, normal monetary policy won't work, you've got to do something different. Here's my suggestion is wage and price freeze, followed by controls. When I saw that letter, I knew why I lost. The chairman of the Fed gave the president advice that turned out to be disastrous, but it was terrible because it worked so well for a short period. I was scared to death. But anyway, in the end, all it did was it held, the controls held back the economy. Arthur thought the controls would control inflation so he could gun the economy. But the gunning of the economy didn't work because the controls had a hold of them. But underneath it, the gunning of the economy produced a lot of suppressed inflation, which broke out. So by the time I came back, I had resigned when he reimposed wage and price controls when I was Secretary of Treasury. Um, but when I came back with President Nixon here, here was the result of it all. So let me, let me ask you one more question now. And this gets to the interplay between institutions and policy and leadership. And here's the question, Richard Nixon versus Ronald Reagan. They're both Republicans. They're both advised by a number of the same advisors. Arthur Burns advise Ronald Reagan, advises Ronald Reagan. You're advising both of them. Both of them listened to Milton Friedman. I think there's some evidence that Ronald, that Ronald Reagan took Milton Friedman more seriously, but they're, they're both in the same stream of thinking and policy advice, and yet as John mentioned, as you have, you've made the point, the difference between Richard Nixon and wage and price controls, an assertion of state power on the one hand, and then Ronald Reagan cutting taxes, rolling back regulation, achieving a stable dollar. What's the difference? Is, to what extent is that a difference in what policymakers and the economics discipline are learning between the 70s and 80s? And to what extent is it, a, is it Ronald Reagan? <laughs> 
Well, I want to surprise you. All right. Because I want to say something good about both of them. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, here is why Ronald Reagan was so beloved. In the re-election campaign, it was obvious we were sweeping. Mondale was his opposite number. And he said, I don't want to humiliate him. Let's let him win his own state. So we pulled all of our ads and our efforts away from Minnesota, and Mondale won it by a lash in Minnesota. But people realized in Reagan there was this kind of compassion. I'm going to win. I don't want to humiliate my opponent. Let him be, have some stature and self-respect. So that's the kind of guy he was. Now here's something on behalf of Nick. Nixon was a strategist, and I was involved in many things with him that involved that. But in 1970, he decided to desegregate the schools in seven southern states. This is 16 years after the Brown decision. They're still segregated. That fact shows you how difficult people thought that process would be. I'm Secretary of Labor, and he, he decides that you can't just have this happen. You've got to manage it. So he appointed a committee with Vice President Agnew, the chairman, and me, the vice chairman. And Agnew would have nothing to do with it. So I became the chairman. And Pat Moynihan was in the White House at the time, so Pat joined my team. And uh, Len Garment, a lawyer, terrific guy, and a man named Murphy, who was an advanced man type. And we went to the president and we said, Mr. President, the way we're going to manage this is we're going to appoint biracial committees in each state. And we're not going to pay any attention to what political party they belong to. All we want is strong, respected people. And that's what we got. So then everybody thought the toughest state would be Mississippi. So we brought our biracial committee to the White House, so the first ones. I knew from my labor relations experience, you got a lot of people blow off steam. So they blew off steam for a while. And then I stopped that, and I brought in the attorney general. And I said, Mr. Attorney General, what are you going to do when the school's open? He said, I'm going to enforce the law. Thank you. Out. So then I could say to them, well, it's been an interesting discussion this morning, but it's irrelevant. It's going to happen. These are your communities. These are your children. So the question is, what are the problems and what can you do about them? And I found that when you get people not talking principles, talking pro problems, then they want to solve the problems. So people would get at it. And then I took them over to the diplomatic reception rooms in the State Department for lunch. And there is a desk that Thomas Jefferson built himself, on which he wrote the Declaration of Independence. The quill is still there. All men are created equal. So we had our lunch. We come back to the White House, and by the time mid-afternoon comes, things are going well. I take them across the hall to the Oval Office, and the President says, here we are in the Oval Office. Think of the things that have affected the security and welfare of our country that have been decided in this office. Well, now we have this major issue, and he said, I've made my decision. But in a country like ours, that's not enough. People in the states and in the communities and the school districts have to make their decisions. That's why you're here. We want to work with you, and if you'll work with us, we'll try to get at this problem. And we had more discussion. They guys went out of that on cloud nine. And so then toward the end, Pat Moynihan and I are feeling pretty good about it. We can pull this off. The last state was Louisiana. So we had the idea, let's go to the South. That'll have great symbolic experience. And we'll have our meeting down there. And then after the meeting, we'll have all the co-chairmen of the other state groups come and have a general meeting before kickoff of the school year. So we have a meeting in the Oval Office, and I make my pitch. And Agnes says, Mr. President, don't go. There you will be in a room. Half the people will be black, half the people will be white. There's going to be blood running through the streets of the South. The blood will be on your hands. Don't go. So the president looks at me and I say, well, Mr. President, whatever happens, it's on your watch. But we've been working hard on this. And you've seen these people come in here. They haven't been idle. They've been working. We've been working with them. And we think this is our best shot at bringing this off in a peaceful, constructive way.
So he decides to go. So Pat and I go down the night before. We're meeting the Louisiana group, and it's dawning on me. It's going okay, but not like it is in Washington. Dawning on me, it's one thing to bring people to the White House. It's another thing to have a meeting in a hotel room in their hometown. It's not the same. But we got pretty well along, and all of a sudden the president arrives, and I had to say, Mr. President, they're not in quite the same stage they usually are when you see them in the Oval Office. You've got to put this over yourself. And he did. He listened to them. He talked to them. And he brought them around. And then we had a meeting of all the people. And it was like a revival meeting. He was saying, have you thought of this problem? Have you thought of that? What are you doing about this? Back and forth all around. It was just exciting. And the schools opened and there was no violence. It happened. So this was a Richard Nixon thing that he did. Strategic importance. He faced up to something that was really difficult. So I can criticize things like anybody else. I resigned when he did something that I thought was important. And, um, but uh, he also did some good things. I had a funny experience with the IRS. One day the commissioner comes to me and he says, I just had a meeting with John Dean who came to my office and gave me this list of about 50 names of people. He says, the president wants to have a full field investigation done on each of them. That's a very unpleasant process if that happens to you. He says, what do I do? I say, you don't do it. I said, well, what do I tell John Dean? Tell John Dean you report to me. And I said, no. So then on the Nixon tapes, there are these discussions between the president and um, Dean. What, what does little blue eyes think he is not doing what we want? But they never had the nerve to come back to me. So we stopped that. But then one day, Johnny Walters comes again. And he says, we have a process at the IRS where we take complicated returns and we do a random number process to select the ones we're going to audit. I said, well, so what are you coming to me about? He said, well, the President Nixon's name came up. <laughs> well, why are you coming to me about it? He said, because we thought maybe you'd like to tell him. <laughs> so I call over and I get uh, Al Haig and I tell him in about a half an hour, he calls me back. He said, the President's up in Camp David. He's steaming. He thinks the IRS is out to get him. And he wants to know by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning whether any other sitting president has ever been audited. So I called to Johnny Walters and said, I don't know what you're planning to do tonight, Johnny, but I'm going to be here at 7.30, and I hope you'll be here too to tell me the answer to this question. Well, Johnny comes and he says, both John F. Kennedy and Franklin D. Roosevelt had complicated returns. They were both audited while they were in office. I said, Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> problems, problems, inequality. The New York Times columnist and Nobel Prize winner for economics, Paul Krugman, quote, the Reagan economy was a one-hit wonder. Yes, there was a boom, but while the rich got richer, there was little sustained economic improvement for most Americans. Close quote. And for that matter, until this very administration, there was very little growth in middle class wages for something like three decades. So we have an indictment of the system. We may have experienced prosperity overall over this last century, but it was very unevenly and some would argue unfairly shared. Lee? So discussion, discussions about inequality, I think, are <clears throat> Among, among the, most the most polarizing issues we face today. And I think there's really two parts to that conversation. Um, and one part I think is very, very misunderstood, uh, just from a factual basis. So you'll often hear in the media that inflation-adjusted wages haven't increased since the 1970s. That's really the wrong comparison because a growing component <clears throat> of worker compensation is employer-provided health care. Healthcare is expensive. Healthcare, be, healthcare can, be, can be as much as 40% of worker compensation. Last year, the Congressional Budget Office, as they do on a regular basis, put together distribution of income statistics. And they include components such as employer provided health care. They also make adjustments which are very sensible from the standpoint of the resources available to a family. They adjust for taxes, they adjust for transfer payments. And the statistics that the CBO came up with <clears throat> are just very, very different than most of the statistics, the, the statistics you'll, you'll read in the media. Uh, since 1979, 
the lowest quintile of household earners, so the bottom 20% have resor their resources, their resources after taxes, including health care, including transfers, have increased by 80%. The resources have increased by 35% just since 2000. So while it's the case that a small number of people such as Bill Gates and Sergey Brin and Jeff Bezos of Amazon have created you know, enormous fortunes, uh, it's not the case that everyone else is not going anywhere. There's been income growth across all quintiles. So it's important to understand what the statistics are measured properly. And then the second point is, you know, hey, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Sergey Brin, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, do they, some people say, do they deserve the wealth that they've accumulated? Well, I would put it, I would, I would flip that coin around and say, these are people who have transformed our society. I mean, the, the, the world we live in today is fundamentally different than the world we lived in the 1970s. And just think about what, what you do with Amazon, what you do with microcomputers and software, uh, how easy it is now to use Google to search and find things. So yes, these people have accumulated large fortunes, but I would say those are almost a grain of sand on the economic beach in terms of what they've done for us. So uh, it's an important issue, but I think it is, is critical to understand what the statistics are and, and, and what those who have really accumulated wealth, what they've done for us. Terry, I want to come uh, to you and just... Could I just add a thing? Go ahead. Bill Gates now spends his formidable energy and intellect on giving his money away. It's a big thing. Uh, you mentioned just now, Lee, that uh, we live in a transformed world. And I asked each of you to think of uh, some invention or development that you saw with your own eyes <laughs> that the younger members of our audience today may find <coughs> difficult to believe. Lee, yours was? So when I, when I was a kid, uh, our neighbors uh, shared a single landline telephone line with their neighbors. Uh, and, you know, we all now will walk around with mobile phones. Uh, and this was very difficult but they, because they had to coordinate who was going to use the phone when. Do I get it at 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. or do you get it from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m.? And they could listen in on each other's phone conversations. Uh, and this was, this was, you know, today this is, just seems like a complete non sequitur. Terry? Well, I came prepared to help the uh, people who are uh, taping this uh, program, so I brought my... Uh, Bell & Howell, uh, you probably don't know about Bell & Howell, it was a company that made these things, and you had to put something called film inside, and then you had to take the <laughs> film to somebody who would then uh, uh, develop it, and then you could put it on your movie projector. And I got no offers from the crew to help the taping, I don't know why. But. <laughs> Terry, challenge to the system, a challenge, an indictment of the system, the environment. Has this century of prosperity come at the expense of our natural environment? Uh, I, I, another thing some of the people may not remember is a Beatles song. Well, the Beatles were a group back uh, a while back. <laughs> and, and the Beatles had a, a famous song, you have to admit it's getting better. I wish I could sing, I would have done a few bars. Uh, and, and I did a Hoover book uh, a while back called You Have to Admit It's Getting Better, and the subtitle is From Economic Prosperity to Environmental Quality. And the bottom line of, of this book and, and the data all support that, that while there may be a period in, in, in the growth, in the prosperity, in the economic process where we are willing to sacrifice the environment in order to have economic growth, uh, that when we get a little bit wealthier and have higher incomes, we become environmentalists. And we are all environmentalists because we can afford to be environmentalists. I've gone to Africa many times and, and, and you, you talk to really poor people in Africa about saving endangered species and they look at you like, are you crazy? I am the endangered species. My children are the endangered species. My corn crops are. So we have to be, once we get rich enough, we can afford to be environmentalists. And the data show over and over that this country, because it is wealthy, 
has turned to improving the environment. And there's just not anything you can measure, whether it's forest cover, whether it's, it's uh, water quality, whether it's general air quality, all of those things have, have been improving as a result of prosperity. And I think that's crucial to keep in mind that it's not, as, as George was talking about earlier, it's not guns or butter. Uh, in this case, it's not the environment or economic growth. They come together and, and our country is a perfect example. You contrast the United States environment with what existed in the former Soviet Union and none of us would want to move there and, and fa or China today with, with the air quality in Beijing. So it, it's, it's economic prosperity allows us to be better environmentalists and, and our country uh, shows that on every single measure. John Cogan. I'd like to build on that and say I think the problem of climate change is very real and we don't have a choice. We have to work on it hard. On this stage, about three or four weeks ago, at a, a conference we had, we brought it over here, and Lucy Shapiro, who's a professor in the medical school, was here, and she talked about the relationship of climate change to disease. It's appalling what's happening. And among other things, for example, tropical diseases are coming north. We should be getting up our diagnostic and treatment capabilities. We're not doing it. But the R&D here at Stanford on energy, and I chair the MIT Advisory Committee on their energy thing, so I see what these people are doing. It's not an accident that the, co the costs of uh, electricity from solar have dropped precipitously or wind. That's a result of the energy R&D. So I think we need a good hefty tax on carbon, make it revenue neutral, and we need to have good support for energy R&D. And I might say here at Stanford and MIT both, the private financing of R&D is three to one government because private people see something is happening and they want to know about it. And a lot of universities say, oh my God, you can't have anything to do with a private company. And we say here and they say at MIT, come on because we can do the R&D, we can figure out what works, we can discover whether it's scalable or not. We don't know how to commercialize it or scale it up. That's what these people know how to do. So it's a good partnership, not a problem. John. Peter, can, can I come back to a point that uh, Lee made sure. about uh, inequality? Um, you know, we all kind of jump to the conclusion that rising inequality is a bad thing. Uh, and that's not quite the right way to look at it. Uh, rising inequality can be part of a good thing uh, or it could be a bad thing. It depends upon the causes. And so as Lee pointed out, um, one source of inequality is entrepreneurs developing products that benefit us all. Uh, and they reap uh, a large surplus from, that, uh, from their inventions. It will create higher inequality, but it's a good thing for everyone. Society is better off because of their in inventions. On the other hand, if inequality is a consequence of people manipulating the rules of the game and extracting surplus from you and from you towards themselves, then I guess we would say that's a, that's a bad thing and we need to take some, uh, some action uh, to prevent it. So when you think about inequality, think <coughs> about not inequality by itself, but think about what the likely causes of that inequality are. And the second point I would make, if you're concerned about inequality, forget the top 1%. Think about the bottom 20% and think about how raising their incomes up more uh, and their uh, standard of living up more, that's where the focus of policy should be. When we look at set aside the 1% and we look at growing inequality, what economists conclude is that part of this inequality increase is due to an increase in the return to skill. And what we're, what we're seeing is the demand for skills, high skilled labor goes up with technological advance, but the supply of skilled workers has not increased accordingly. And that's why the return to skill has gone up. And so what we need to think about doing with our education system, with our training, with our employment system is increasing the skills, the high skills uh, 
of workers, raising those people that have low skills at the bottom towards the top. That's where the focus of policy should be for me, not on the on the one percent. John, how Warren you? Buffett, Warren Buffett on this, he says, the guy who's much less wealthy than I am watches the Super Bowl on the same kind of TV I do. So there are a lot of common goods here. Yep. John, how did you handle data when you were working on your doctorate in the 1970s? Oh, so this is this is a little more show and tell. So students today that are that are working uh, in statistics don't know how good you have it. <laughs> you think about it when you're making a statistical calculation, you don't have to you don't have to go anywhere. You can sit in your apartment, pull out your laptop, type in a few commands, and within seconds you get your statistical results. Well, it was very, very different when we were working on our dissertations and we were in school. Back then, what you first had to do was to sit down and write out a set of detailed instructions, pages and pages long, detailing everything that the computer had to do. And it was done not in a language that was anything remotely related to English. For some reason, they decided that Fortran would be the language of COBOL, which had no relationship to English. But in any event, after you got done writing it up, you then went down the hall to your, um, uh, your, to your room that had punch card machines. You remember those old punch card machines? Well, here is a punch card. And so you would type out all of your instructions on that punch card. Now, for my thesis, for the last run of my thesis, I had a punch card deck that was about this size, about 87 cards. Uh, to run some uh, statistical analysis. So once you got done, though, punching up your punch cards, you then took it over to submit it to run on the computer. And so there was a computer operator who took your punch cards uh, and told you something like, uh, well, uh, you're in the queue, Kogan. Uh, come back in a few hours. A few hours? Yeah, a few hours. So in event, you come back in a few hours, and sure enough, you had you know, some typo in your program, and the program didn't run. So you go back to the punch card table, punch, redo your, find your error, correct it, walk back to the computer, to the computer operator, resubmit it. It's in the queue, Kogan. Be back in, be back in a couple of hours. So this would, have, this would go on and on and on. And as it went on, a new worry would start entering your mind. The new worry was, you drop your deck. <laughs> so, now, most of you young people, you don't know how, many, how often did people, it became so commonplace, but people were dropping the decks all the time as, you know, five or six trips back and forth. But in any event, I always thought that maybe, just maybe, uh, this automation of running regressions and doing statistical work hasn't really been all that beneficial because now students run you know, 500 regressions within, within a couple of hours and choose the best results. But it did teach me one thing. There was some individual somewhere, his name's been lost to history, who ingeniously figured out a nice way for you to, after you drop your cards, to know how to put them back together again. What he did was he drew a simple diagonal line from one side of the deck to the other. So when you dropped the deck, you just had to match up the lines. So, True American genius. <laughs> the students who are here today, if you take nothing else away from this panel, take this. You have no idea how old guys like us suffered for your... <laughs> so that you can lead the lives you lead. Last segment here, and then we'll, we, we'll, have a, we'll try hard to save a few moments for questions. Piece of history and a statistic. As this institution, here's the piece of history, as this institution was being founded in 1919, the Bolsheviks were consolidating their power in the Soviet Union and proclaiming communism as a system that would create a kind of paradise on earth for ordinary people. Seven decades later, when the Soviet Union collapsed, income per person in the USSR was only one-third that in the United States. That's the piece of history. Here's the statistic. A very recent poll showed that 19% of American millennials hold a favorable view of communism. I'll repeat that. One in five young Americans holds a favorable view of communism. 
Terry Anderson, what's going on? Well, I, I, I think the, the dri a driving force in this is the discussion we've had here about, about income inequality and this notion that somehow the system that has given us this, pro this, this progress, this century of progress, has, has solidified these kind of strata that people can't get out of. And uh, I, I think that's a, a large driving force. And I think then that is, is coupled with uh, a notion that somehow if we just collectivize our decisions, we'll get it right this time. That, you know, the Soviet Union had these leaders who didn't understand that Venezuela isn't working because South America is different and that somehow if we can move in the direction of a collective decision that that will will all come together as one big happy family uh, and overcome the politics that that of course has divided us so 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 much and I, I think that it's a combination of those two things that's leading to this this idea that you know and it's wrong well I think the data tell us that it's right. wrong. You, right. so you've given those. Well, all right, so Margaret, here's a question on data. Margaret Thatcher said, Social, socialism works until you run out of other people's money. Well, and if I can add to that, Ronald Reagan said, said that uh, social, socialism works well in two places, in heaven where you don't need it and hell where they already have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you just talked about the data. Listen to this. Since Deng Xiaoping opened China to free markets in 1979, China has lifted some 750 million people out of poverty while remaining under the control of the Communist Party. Communism and economic growth can go hand in hand. It didn't work in the Soviet Union, but it certainly seems to be working in China, and young Americans are smart enough to see that. Lee? Working in China, not better than 1979 but not nearly as good as the world they could they could live in so in 1979 per capita income in china was 349 dollars per year about one one hundredth of u.s per capita income and just to set this age before deng came in China in the 1970s was not so different than the China of the late 50s and 60s under Mao when just a horrendous experiment of trying to use government planning for markets resulted in a famine that killed 60 million Chinese people. Um, the level of income in a society is proportionate to the extent and quality of democratic governance and the extent to which there's protection of property rights and economic freedom. And under Deng, China expanded economic freedom substantially. So now there's private businesses operating in China. Uh, today, Chinese per capita income is no longer one one hundredth of the US. It's about 17% of the US. It's increased because one component of what society needs to do to, to grow, expand economic freedom. China did some of that. But Teaching at UCLA for the last 20 years, I've had a number of Chinese students, and interestingly, all of them want to stay here. None of them want to go back to China. And what they often talk about are the sharp restrictions on civil liberties and personal freedoms they face, the fact that they can't use the internet freely, the fact that they're afraid to complain, the fact that they're afraid to criticize the government. Um, China used to grow at 12% per year compared to our 3% per year. That was 12 years ago. Today, to the best of our knowledge, China is growing about 4% per year compared to our 3% per year. They're at 17% of where we are now. Unless they improve the quality and extent of democratic governance, they'll never come close to catching up to the US. Not even close. George? As the Cold War was drawing to a close, you knew it, most of us did not know it, that the Cold War was drawing to a close. You have, I've heard you tell this story that you have, you gave Mikhail Gorbachev tutorials in free market economics. Would you explain what was going on there? Well, I got him aside. He's a bright guy. Let me tell you how bright he is. He came here to San Francisco after I left office, he was still in office, more or less to see me. And he came down to Stanford, 
And he said, I'd like to have a meeting with some of the leading intellectual lights at Stanford and interchange with them. So I arranged it. And you practically had to be a Nobel laureate to make the cut. And we had chemists and chemical engineers and physicists and mathematicians and uh, Milton Friedman was the economics and so on around the room. <clears throat> so these were really first class people. And I had a meeting the day before with them and I said, you've got to figure out how to say in about four minutes something significant in your field that has some real meaning to it. Otherwise, we won't get around the room. So we went around the room <clears throat> and he responded with information and candor to each statement that was made. It was a breathtaking display of his intellectual capacity. So one time we were meeting in the Kremlin and we had a break and I said, let me show you something. And I had some information there and I said, we are moving into a new era. It's called the information age. And if you have a society that's closed and printed, you're going to miss out on it. It's going to leave you behind. And he bought it. And it got in, I'm told it got into the Politburo notes. And he tried to implement that. And I think he was right. Uh, we, could talk, we could talk and talk. But I want to get to a couple of questions. So I return to the man who's occupied 99 of these last 100 years. George Shultz, as a boy, you experienced the Great Depression. As a Marine, you fought in the Second World War. As a young economist, you served in the Eisenhower White House. I like Ike. I like Ike. <laughs> helping to put in place the policies that permitted the economic expansion of the 50s and 60s. Then you served in the cabinets of two presidents determined to defend this nation and its values during the Cold War, serving as Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State as one of the architects of the collapse of communism. As you told us in the film when we began, five children, 11 grandchildren, six, soon to be seven, great grandchildren. What do young Americans most need to understand about the duties they will be called upon to fulfill? Well, I think it all starts with your family. A good family life is the building block of society. And it's your great thing. And I always look forward to our family gatherings. And I watch these great grandchildren. And they're so lively. They're curious about everything. Every once in a while, one of them learns something. And they look at you and laugh. And look at me, I just learned something. So you learn, you see, we're born curious and we're born loving to learn. So we want to keep that fire burning all the time. Then it seems to me we work in some place, so we want to be part of that workplace. We want to make it a friendly place and we want to make it fun to come. And we have a community to contribute to. So all of these things are there. And then it seems to me, and you get this out of serving in the armed forces, a certain patriotism. You want to serve your country. That's and you're a Marine and serving overseas and in other, the other services, it's the same thing happens to you. And you learn a lot of things. You learn that you succeed as a team. As an individual, you're no nothing. You're a team and you work with teams. And the team has a leader. And you don't always get your way, but you, but you follow that leader. And every once in a while, you're a leader and you've got to get people to follow. So I'm for that reason, I'm supporting an organization called With Valor. And we support anybody who's been a veteran, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, because we think if you're a veteran, you've learned these skills of saying, I'm part of a team and I want to get something accomplished. I'm patriotic. So that's my advice. Terry Anderson, Leo Hanian, John Kogan, George Schultz. Join me in thanking our panel, if you would. We have, we'll, we have microphones here. If you'd like to, we, I think we have a few minutes for questions. We may be able to get in one or two questions if anyone has a question. And if, go, go right ahead. <laughs> 
But just, just to temper those of you who may be considering asking questions, there are refreshments just outside. <laughs> so talk fast. Uh, so I'm curious what you think about the sort of long line of academics perennially declaring doom, whether it be like the population bomb or the various other theories that human life quality is about to drastically decrease. Um, how were they so wrong? Why were they so wrong? Why does it keep happening? That is a I, profound question. Anybody? I, I, let me take a crack at it, and I think it's quite simple. I think that those, those uh, uh, predictions are ignore the kind of, of pro, uh, the, the factors that have contributed to our prosperity. They are based on a notion that there's a fixed amount of stuff, be they resources, uh, space on the earth, and that we are, it's, it's a wall and we are on a freight train with increasing speed and we must hit the wall. And I think what the progress of the last century is, is not only understanding how to regulate the speed of the train, but moving the wall, sometimes creating a whole new set of tracks as, as uh, has been discussed here. And, and so I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because I think what, what Secretary Schultz has been talking about is still in us. And I think it's the, that, that drive of hu human ingenuity that's difficult to keep down, whether it's in China, and especially difficult to keep down here because we have the right institutions that make it work. Do you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Great question. Um, we've been able to avoid those types of catastrophes um, because people are capable of remarkable things and markets allow people to create remarkable things. Uh, suppression of the market means people can't create that. And sadly, most of the problems that we face throughout history, uh, to echo some of George's points, are ones that we've done to ourselves. Um, the free market process is a truly remarkable one. Uh, if there's something we need, we figured out a way to produce it. Question? Yeah, question. I originally came from China, yeah. Then I uh, got a chance almost admit to the Stanford, but I feel that's too expensive. So I went to UCLA <laughs> and graduate. <laughs> then I worked for uh, Vice Chancellor, you know, my, uh, um, Grand Mike, uh, Mike Granfield. Yeah, it's Anderson uh, formal dean. But, uh, anyway, and I stay well, for UCLA, and the School of Medicine give me the green car, and I stay. So, just that's why right. most uh, students came from China. They decide to stay in this country because uh, freedom, you know, you know, and more safe. Yeah. But my question is currently, you know, U.S. have uh, fires, you know, uh, trade war with China, right? And China raised up as a second econ economy power, right, GP, uh, you know, in the world. So, so what is the future, you know, uh, your expert, you know, predict, you know, what, what will happen with the trade war between China, then what will be relationship with the uh, U.S. in China, yeah. John, the question is U.S. US and China trade war, and the larger question, what's the future of relations between China and the United States? John, do you want to take a first crack? Yeah. So I hesitate to try to predict the future, but I don't see a, tr a trade war in the offing. Uh, what I see is an administration that is using uh, for the first time, uh, different uh, tactics uh, to get the Chinese to open their markets, to get the Chinese to uh, respect uh, property rights, uh, to get the uh, Chinese to respect our patents uh, and open, our, open their markets uh, to our businesses. Uh, I don't see that uh, ending up in a, uh, in a trade war. I think the costs of a trade war are too high on both sides. Uh, so I see eventually, and my hope is, uh, eventually uh, we'll get a resolution which will lower uh, these uh, barriers to entry uh, and open up much more of a, a trade pattern uh, between uh, China and the United States. Okay. Thank you. I, th I think over, do you have a question? Yeah, but. Oh, okay. Oh, you got there first. All right. Uh -huh. 
Um, I'm wondering with the current monetary policy of the national debt just keep increasing exponentially, um, are we going to have to reduce it at some time and will that significantly decrease growth? The debt, the national debt is growing faster than the economy, John. It I actually sort of think that's your fault, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do about that? So you're right. The, the, uh, the national debt has been growing faster than the economy for now over a decade. And so we are on an unsustainable path. And the projection of spending, of course, is much more rapid in the next 10 and 20 years than it has been in the past. So the way I've looked at it is we, we face this enormous challenge that if we don't gain control over these big entitlement programs, mostly Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, we are going to have either an enormous explosion in our debt or we're going to have to impose uh, large, significant uh, taxes. Two numbers. If we did nothing to control Social Security and Medicare, we'd have to raise each and every tax in the federal tax code by 50% in 20 years. What we know from economics is that would be profoundly damaging to the growth in the economy. If we choose not to rely on taxes and instead we rely on debt to finance uh, these payments, the national debt will rise to about 150% of our national income, twice the level that it is today. What we know from history is that eventually excessive levels of debt cause propensity for financial crises, inflation, or slower economic growth. So the consequences for prosperity of not dealing with the entitlement problem I think are very significant. We've got some time to deal with it. We don't have to take it on tomorrow, but we've got to deal with it within the next few years. But I also think you don't have to tear up the safety net. The kind of changes that have to be made in these programs, if they're made in the near term, can be very gradual. They can slow the growth uh, to a level that's affordable without uh, cutting benefits significantly. It takes a lot of reform, uh, but, but it's definitely uh, doable. George, you've been involved in a lot of these big reforms. Yeah. You've been, you've been involved in a lot of the big reforms over the last 20 years. You've watched the debt rise. What's your sort of sense about this? Well, I think you take health care. The costs are exploding. We know how to produce better health at lower cost. We know how to do that. We need a political process that will get there. And at least in my experience, what you do is you put the ideas out there and you keep working them. And sooner or later, they necessity comes and you're ready. Sometimes it takes a crisis of some kind. And my experience is a crisis can pass without anything happen unless you're ready. So it's very important to be ready. And the kind of studies we do around here are helping to get people ready. So that's the way to get it done as far as I can see. Thank you. Last question. No pressure, just make it very, very good. <laughs> Uh, at the risk of taking us off topic, I'd really love to hear from each of the speakers what book you've read in your life that was most influential and deeply affected you. That's a terrific question. Uh, Terry, the uh, most influential book. Huh? Start with Kogan. Start with Kogan? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just here. I, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, we'll end with him. The, the question was the most influential book you've That's read. A very good question. In your life. You get a moment to think about it. All right. Your, your life is much less uh, extensive, Boy, John. Go right ahead. That is a very, very good, tough question. You have stumped but, the panel. I, I, All right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I start thinking, oh, I need to go back before that one, oh, before that one. But I, I'm going to stick with the modern one. For me, Matt Ridley's book, The Rational Optimist, just, just creates such optimism that, that, that I consider it a must read just to keep us focused on the fact that what we've been talking about today not only has happened but can continue to happen because we as human beings are so inquisitive and, and so interested in learning. Matt Ridley, R-I-D-L-E-Y, The Rational Optimist. Director 
Gilligan, you stand on the stage, you've got to answer the questions. <laughs> free, free to choose, Milton Friedman. Got it. <laughs> got it. Okay. Lee? Uh, a, a series of books I read by John Steinbeck helped push me into becoming an economist. Um, so can, Cannery, and he wrote, he wrote about life during the Depression, um, and Cannery Row was one that really moved me. Wow. John. So I don't, I don't know if I can give you my favorite, but I, I would say this, the most impactful for me in the last 15, 20 years was uh, Modern Times by Paul Johnson. It's a history of the uh, 20th century and the growth and rise of, uh, of communism. Uh, to me, the signature event of the 20th century was the rise of authoritarian governments in the form of communism uh, and the collapse of those regimes. And Paul Johnson tells the best story of how that came about. So. And that was published in 82, as I recall, so you get it just as the turn is beginning under Reagan. George? I've, been re I've just finished reading a book by Doris Carnes Goodwin entitled Leadership. And she examines Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and LBJ. It's extraordinary. She shows how their leadership qualities evolved. In the case of TR, he lost his mother and his wife practically on the same day. And he went out into what he called the Badlands. He became a cowboy and an environmentalist. And the cowboy is kind of self-dependent, shaped his character. In the case of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, I didn't realize it, but he was quite an athlete as a young man. And then he was struck. And he struggled at it. And he wound up creating Warm Springs, which is a place where people who had this problem could go and get treatment and, and be able to handle themselves. So out of the adversary came a leadership style and quality and a competence that you could have hit by something bad and you could still come out of it and learn from it. So it's a, it's a very good book to lead, read about leadership. And we've talked here some about the importance of leadership. So I particularly enjoyed this book. Perfect. Tom, over to you. Gentlemen, great job. Uh, thank you all for attending. Please join me in a round of applause for our panelists.